Well, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whichever one it may be that you're watching this video. Um, so grateful to be able to speak with the whole Bangor stake all at once. And I'm very grateful that you're not all right here and intimidating me by your presence. So instead I get to just talk to a screen, which sometimes makes it easier, sometimes doesn't. Um, the uh, I'm, I'm very excited to be digitally in your homes and on your devices, able to share a message that, that actually has been on my, time, on my mind for some time. I'm sure King Benjamin is, is looking down at our technology right now and wishing he had this when he was speaking from his tower. That, that probably would have made it much easier for him. But I have had all of you on my mind as I have prepared for this talk. I have considered what, what, what do we need here in the Bangor stake? What do we need to be a strong, protective stake of Zion that has members who find joy in each other, participate in meaningful service, are self-reliant, and are perfected through temple attendance? If that sounds familiar, that is our, our stake goal, our stake vision. And it seems right now our life is at a standstill. We, we may feel like we're bench warmers, either eager to get into the game or possibly grateful that the coach just hasn't put us in because we didn't want to look bad at all. To some, this is a time to slow down, and to others, it's been more hectic than ever before. None of us are facing the same challenges, though, and yet all of us are facing similar challenges. We are all individuals with individual challenges in the midst of a societal predicament. While we are in this together, we're also facing it alone. It's kind of all these opposites happening. And, and that's what makes this such a challenge, this whole situation. You know, we, as in, in the state council and in our high council meetings, we've discussed the issues and problems that are facing our stake. And with President Peterson, President Kilgour, President DeGrasse, and it's always encouraging to hear all the successes of the, the units that have uh, been able to pull together and do these digital meetings and gathering and checking in on each other. With young women meeting on Zoom nights or young men meeting to play games on Zoom, whatever it might be. It is such just a wonderful time. It's wonderful to see this technology being put to such good use. What concerns me, though, is that as things start to normalize, will we be slow to remember the things we learned during this time? This, this time of self-reflection, time of figuring out what's essential in our lives, what do we need to be focusing on, how do we focus on it? So will we be slow to remember these things, or will we hasten to the work once we are able to get back out and visit and do the things that we love to do and gathering every Sunday together with all of our friends and all of our neighbors. Something from conference has really stood out to me as I've been pondering this. And it was something that President Nelson said in response to a young child's question in the first session of, of the Sunday of the Saturday conference. A little girl named Pearl asked, Is it hard to be a prophet? Are you, like, really busy? And President Nelson said, Of course it's hard. Everything to do with becoming more like the Savior is difficult. For example, when God wanted to give the Ten Commandments to Moses, where did he tell Moses to go? Up on top of a mountain, and on the top of Mount Sinai. So Moses had to walk all the way up to the top of that mountain to get the Ten Commandments. Now, Heavenly Father could have said, Moses, you start there, and I'll start here, and I'll meet you halfway. No. And here's the key. The Lord loves effort, because effort brings rewards that can't come without it. Close quote. So, the Lord loves effort. That is what has stood out in my mind. It hit me harder than anything else during, during General Conference, and I've been thinking about it ever since then. You know, what effort has the Lord asked of me? How much effort is required? What effort have I lacked? What effort should I be putting forth right now during this pandemic? And what effort will I need to put forth once we normalize? Those of you 
who have heard me speak in the last few months will remember that I try to bring up three seemingly random things and I try to stitch them together for a, for a topic. Sometimes I leave it up to my family to pick those things. Today, I kind of cheated. I'm going to use three things that stood out to me during my study and while I've been thinking about this topic of the Lord loves effort. So those three things are dots, a mite, and the waters of Cebus. So we believe that the first principles and ordinances of the gospel are first, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, second, repentance, third, baptism by immersion for the remission of sins, fourth, laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. The fourth article of faith that Joseph Smith wrote sets the stage for our discussion of effort. The effort that we make during the first principles and ordinances sets the stage for the effort it will take to return to live with our Heavenly Father. Faith is our effort applied to our lives. Faith is the effort that we apply to living a righteous manner, the effort it takes to call those that need someone to talk to, the effort of reading the scriptures every day, even if we are in a hurry or rushed to do other things, the effort to kneel down and pray to our Heavenly Father and thank Him each day and report back to Him our daily labors. Repentance is the effort we apply to change our lives. It is the constant work we do each day to improve ourselves a little more than yesterday, to progress toward perfection. Baptism is the first ordinance where we commit to the, to the effort of following God's commandments. And then the gift of the Holy Ghost is the blessing of having the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost, to bring remembrance of all things and to us and to encourage us in our effort-filled lives. The gospel is all about putting forth the effort to learn our ways, improve our lives, and return to God's presence. So dots. I don't mean the little stickers that you put, little dots or anything like that. I mean the candy, that box of candy. So early in our marriage, Melissa quickly figured out or discovered that I am not very good at giving gifts. I would get her things that she needed, like a vacuum or spatulas or something like that. But not things that were really gift-worthy, things that, you know, someone would want when you get a gift. Um, I didn't really realize at the time the difference when it came to gift-giving, whether it was something you needed or wanted. Um, or what a good gift would be like. So, in preparation to one Valentine's Day, I was racking my brain because I had really not done a great job with making a good gift. And so I remembered how many times we sat down to watch a movie and she loved eating dots candy, those good old classic dots. And But she didn't like all the dots. She specifically loves the yellow, orange, and pink dots and absolutely hates the green and red ones. So I got to eat all the green and red ones while she got to eat those other ones, which bonus for me because I had my own candy. Um, so what I did is I went to the store and I bought a few boxes of dots. And when she wasn't around, I opened all the boxes, sorted out all the colors, and made her the perfect box of dots. I had put in some effort. I thought about it. I worked on it. It was one of the least expensive gifts I have ever given. But to this day, it is the most epic of gifts. It is my shining moment as a husband of gift giving. Now, I've never be quite been able to get to that level. I've gotten close on a few things. But to her, it was an amazing gift. Not because it was this expensive or not just because it was inexpensive. But it was the thought. It was the, the, the effort that I had put in. The effort of mind and work that I had to put into it. Something so small meant so much. It wasn't arduous. It wasn't difficult to do. I didn't have to hike to a mountain peak or, or talk to a guru and, or anything like that. I simply had to put in a little effort, more effort than I did before, and I was able to get the blessings, per se, of, of doing that effort. And I, I just had to think about what she liked and what I could do for her and how can I make something she likes into something more perfect. 
So the effort that we put into the service of one another is amplified when done in love. It is through the love of our fellow man that drives us to work harder for them. During the last week of the Savior's life, he taught his disciples the great lesson of sacrifice, and that through sacrifice we gain all the blessings of God. And this is where two mites come in. Now you know where I'm going. The scriptures say, And he looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he said, Of a truth I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For all these have of their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God. But she of her penury hath cast in all the living that she had. We all have the ability to give to the Lord. We all face the decisions every day of what effort we will place on the altar of sacrifice. Some of us give time. Some of us give food. We can all find ways that we can give to the Lord. Remember from our recent Come Follow Me lesson, quote, And behold, I tell you these things that ye may learn wisdom, that ye may learn that when ye are in the service of your fellow beings, ye are only in the service of your God. When we serve one another, we are serving our Heavenly Father. Many people in this world are lost in the sense, lost in the sense that they don't know if the work they are doing is worth it. Theodore Roosevelt even said, far and away the best prize that life offers is the chance to work hard at work worth doing. But what is that work? What is the work worth doing? How do we know? President Nelson says that it's through personal revelation that we can find out. We, we learn from the scriptures. We learn through personal revelation. In Doctrine and Covenants, it says, Now behold, a marvelous work is about to come forth among the children of men. Therefore, O ye that embark in the service of God, see that ye serve him with all your heart, might, mind, and strength, that ye may stand blameless before God at the last day. Therefore, if ye have desires to serve God, ye are called to the work. If ye have desires to serve God, ye are called to the work. Which leads me to the waters of Cebus. I have two all-time favorite scripture prophets. You ask my kids this, ask my wife. They know exactly who the two I'm talking about. I fell in love with them when I was little. First of all, because of their swords. But as I've studied and learned from their stories, I've grown to truly appreciate them more and more. First one is Elijah. And if you don't know his sword story, you need to read the script. You look it up because it's pretty darn cool. Um, and Ammon from the Book of Mormon. So Ammon, he was one of the sons of Mosiah. Mosiah was the king of Zarahemla. In the Book of Mormon, he and his brothers were best friends with this guy named Alma the Younger, who is the son of Alma, who you know has a bigger story before that. Um, these sons of Mosiah and Alma the Younger, in their early days, caused quite a ruckus. They kicked against the church. They they fought against it. They were wicked, and they had a major conversion story that turned their lives around. And an angel came to them, and they were shaken to the core. So and after that happened, after Alma the Younger and all these sons of Mosiah had been truly converted to the, to the gospel, they had a desire, these the sons of Mosiah had a desire not to be king, but to serve a mission. They decided they were going to go and serve in their the land of their enemy, the Lamanites. The Lamanites had turned away from from the from the gospel and hated the Nephites. So Ammon and his brothers decided to go off and do this. Ammon, when he approached the city, he was captured by the Lamanite guards, and they brought him before the king, and the king asked him why he was there. And Ammon told him he was there to live among them and to serve them. 
And apparently that was quite the effect on King Lamoni, which who was the king of the Lamanites in that land, because he immediately was impressed and offered him one of his daughters to marry. That was quite a reaction. Um, to have a Nephite, who the Lamanites thought were these they thought they were better than us. They, you know, they, they think they're better than us. They're going to come in here and try to do all this stuff. But Ammon was there with a true service-minded heart and wanted to serve the king. He wanted to show that living the gospel was the way of the Lord. And he, you know, politely declined having, you know, to marry the daughter and was assigned some tasks, and one of them was to defend, to, to go take his flocks off and water them and, and have them drink and take care of the sheep. Well, there's some backstory, apparently, you know, and these, these other Lamanites liked to watch the king's servants get killed because they would go and scatter the sheep, and when they... They couldn't gather up all the sheep, they would be punished. And um, so Ammon was there, and he was able to um, defend the sheep. Once they got scattered, he calmed everyone down, and he took matters into you know his own hands and defended the sheep. We all can read that story in, in, in Alma, and uh, there's a sword involved. Um, but that wasn't the miracle, right? The miracle didn't happen when he defended at the waters of Cebus. That was that's why it's called waters of Cebus. That's where he took the flocks. Um, the miracle didn't happen at that time. But what really struck the king was after this huge apex of service happened. Um, when the other servants were astonished at how powerful Ammon was and defended all of these, you know, these flocks and saved their lives, um, they, they, they came to the king and told him about this and, and proved it to him. And the king asked, well, where is Ammon? And they said, um, he's taking care of your horses like you asked. He just continued on with his effort. He didn't bask in the glory. He didn't do anything like that. He was humble and was continually serving. Sometimes people see the blessings in our lives and they think, well, they don't understand where I am. They don't understand what I'm going through. How can the gospel change me, this person that ha that is so far away from the life that you're leading. And that's, that's our opportunity to put in some effort. That's our opportunity to continually, continually love them and show them that it wasn't by a snap of the fingers that we were able to get the understanding of this gospel and how it changes our lives. It wasn't this simple pill that we took that all of a sudden made us, you know, have a, a better life. It took effort and it takes effort. And when people think that it doesn't take effort, that's when they get disappointed and they find that the gospel doesn't work for them. We are a church of effort. We are a church of faith. We are a church of hard work, a church that requires service, that requires our hearts, our minds, our time. And the more we give, the more that we can do his will and serve our fellow men, that we can talk to our neighbors here in Maine, that we can live the lives that he would have us live, that he would be living if he were here. As we put in that extra effort, we will see the miracles happen. We will see the blessings come that wouldn't have normally come without that effort. We can trust in ourselves. We can trust in our personal experience and revelation 
to teach us and to guide us into doing what we need to do. So when we do have that opportunity, we will be able to go out and put in that extra effort. My challenge to you is to ponder what effort are you going to make this week? What do you want to give a little bit more to the Lord? What service, what outreach, what other actions can you take to offer this unto the Lord? I know that as we do this, as we seek the Lord's guidance, as we put in a little extra effort in our reading the scriptures, in our reaching out to our neighbors, in talking to our neighbors about the gospel, that effort in our own lives that we haven't maybe put in, that we should probably put in, as we give, give this little bit more effort, we will see our lives change. We will see miracles happen in our lives. And we'll be able to share those with those around us and those that have, haven't gotten to this point, maybe. And you can talk to them about it and say, this is where I was. This is where, this is the effort I had to put in to be able to get here. I know that God loves us. I know that our prophet is leading us and he cares for us and he prays for us. I know that our state presidency is is concerned about how how we're going to be able to make sure everyone is taken care of during this time where we don't get to see each other so regularly or so often. My heart goes out to all of you that that are lonely, that need need help and need need people. We all need that. And I ask you to to continue praying to to reach out to those that you are thinking of right now that could use a phone call, an email, a letter, whatever it might be. Reach out to them, talk to them, see how they're doing, put in that effort. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.